Hey, well, thanks for coming. I don't know uh, what tour this is, but uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Six Secrets to Soybean Success. So uh, this is the Illinois Soybean Association coming to me and saying, well, we want to make soybean management a little sexier. And I said, well, uh, make it secret. Uh, but uh, I don't keep a secret very well, so I'm going to tell them to you. Uh, that, these are the six factors that each year can have a positive impact on soybean yield. And we're going to show you these. We'll justify some of them, and then we'll show you how knowing this information allows us to put together a, a high management systems approach to bring you to the next soybean level, uh, some of which we have demonstrated uh, right here uh, today. So um, I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you uh, I know why you want to grow high soybean. It's so you make more money. But it's also part of uh, your heroic quest to save the world. And the world's problem is procreation to too many people. And I know you've heard this a bunch of times. In the next 40 years, the, there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet. And in order to feed those extra people, we need to double crop production. And that includes soybean. And I, I looked it up. If the average yield of soybean in the US in a normal year is 42 bushels, I doubled it and rounded it off. 85 is the, is the quest. That's the holy grail. I know 100 sounds better, but it's a lot harder than 85, and 85 would be double. So that's what we're after. And I'm going to tell you, 85 is a real challenge. I'll show you the, the, the average yield in the U.S. of corn and soybean you know, over the last 80 to 100 years. And cor corn here is in orange. That's a Illini orange, by the way. And uh, soybean in Illini blue. And you know, so corn yield sort of didn't do much for a lot of years until we came up with hybrids, nitrogen fertilizer, biotechnology, and and uh, you know, and, and of course corn yield varies according to the, that year's weather. But it, but on average, it goes up two bushels per acre per year. And you notice that, and that's why you manage your corn. A lot of people think soybean yields have stagnated. Not true. If you look at the soybean yields over the last 80 years, they've tweaked up. Uh, not quite the rate of corn. Point almost 0.4 bushels per acre per year. Now, uh, if that's the rate of gain that we keep on, it's going to take us 100 years to reach the 85. So we got to do something about it. We have to more than, more than uh, double that rate of gain. And that's sort of why you're here. That's, uh, that's the premise behind the six secrets. Now, before I get to the six secrets, there are, there are some good things about soybean that aren't, that aren't the secrets, but they're still good particularly if you're in a corn soybean rotation. If soybean was your previous crop to corn, your corn crop scores a 25 bushel yield increase. You don't even have to do anything. You just get it. So uh, corn benefits from soybean. And I want, I want you to think about the, the soybean crop. Soybean is a taproot. And so uh, that taproot crop, that changes the soil tilth. It sort of grows down, breaks up compaction. And anybody that's ever chisel plowed corn or soybean stubble Man, you know those crops work up differently. I got, I'll show you one day, this is one day after a fall chisel plow, where, where I have a corn or soybean as the previous crop, and, and it wasn't chisel plowed too early, it's perfect. So here, here's where I have, here's where I, where I had soybean as a previous crop, and right next to it, there's third year corn. Talk about a difference in soil tilth. You know, when I'm over here, this is mellow. Uh, I mean, on this side, I could skip across this side in my bare feet you know, I'm singing a song or something. But then when I get over here, I might sprain my ankle, fall down and gouge my eye out on a piece of stock residue. And the problem is root balls. I mean, corn plants with their fibrous root system, instead of breaking that compaction up, they glue soil particles to the root. You know, and that, that, makes, it, that makes it a lot harder when you're trying to plant into it. You know, if you were planting your corn, would you rather plant into this or this? So this is another advantage of soybean. It improves the soil tilth for your next year's corn crop. Now, uh, here, here's the sad fact of life. It's what I call a prerequisite. And a prerequisite is what you have to have or do before you can have or do what you want to do. OK, I'm in the education game, and so well, there's a lot of prerequisites in my world. If you want to send your sons or daughters to a fantastic school like the University of Illinois, they got to have certain prerequisites. I mean, your kid has to have a, a high school degree, a pretty good one, good test scores. You have to have a lot of money. I mean, those are the prerequisites. And there's some prerequisites to the six secrets, too. 
And I don't mean they're not important, they're actually crucial, but a prerequisite is something you have to have in place first. It either doesn't add yield or it doesn't have to be done every year. I mean this site right here, this would be a festering swamp if it wasn't for tile drainage. You know, now the tile guy says I need a new tile between all my other tiles and that's pretty expensive, but uh, more I'm happy when it's, done, when it's done. Weeds don't add yield by the way, I'd rather not have any, you know. I mean remember the days when I could let the weeds grow up and hit them once with glyphosate and then harvest a clean field at the end of the year? I'm pretty sure I'd lost some yield in the meantime, but those days are over. Got to prevent the weed from coming up in the first place. And apparently if a weed never emerges, it can't become resistant to the herbicide. So that, that's a prerequisite. And uh, we'll, we'll, talk a little, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit about the soil. Uh, but, but, but as far as managing the soil for soybean, it's largely about the pH. Soybean is very sensitive to the pH of the soil. You know, is it too high? Is it too low? So um, drainage, weed control, pH, these are, these are uh, three key prerequisites to the six secrets. And after that, uh, I'll show you all the six secrets with no fanfare. I'm going to have to put it all in one poster because these posters are expensive. I have an understanding of the biology of the soybean crop. And then I read textbooks and scientific literature to come up with the order, which basically means I made it up. <laughs> but, uh, and I'll try and justify it. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here and say, plant early for high soybean yield. Uh, good luck with that if the weather's not in the mood. And, I only need a year like this year to remind me. So as much as I want to plant early, it's determined by the weather, so it's not my control. If I had my wish for soybean weather, I'd like to have it warm and not too wet or in the spring. But I really want rain in August. You know, rain in August is my, my number one wish for soybean yield. Now the second secret, I, and I think this one's going to be a little surprise to you. There's a couple of decent reasons for this. The second secret's fertility. And I'm going to let Ross Bender here, I failed to introduce Ross, he's the PhD student that's uh, working on this. A lot of Ross's uh, graduate work is about fertility, and so I'll let him tell you why soil fertility is the second secret of soybean success. Interesting component of uh, the six secrets, fertility number two. And in, in some respects, it's actually not surprising at all that number two is, is fertility. And, and the reason for that is there's three, three reasons actually. One of which is we don't pay attention to soybean fertility very closely. A lot of times we'll fertilize our corn crop the, year be, the, the fall before we grow our corn. Hopefully there's leftover for, uh, fertilizer from the corn that can supply the needs for a soybean crop. That's not the case. Number two, uh, we don't pay attention to the right nutrient uh, for soybean production. I'll tell you what that one is in here in just a second. And then finally, third, we have, uh, we have these uh, fantastic nodules on the soybean roots. And, and in some cases, that it supplies some nitrogen for our soybean crop, but not all. And, and I'll explain to you that in a little more detail here in the next uh, slide. The interesting thing about soybean is that uh, it actually requires more nitrogen fertilizer than a corn crop. So what I have here in this entire slide is, is the nutritional requirements for a corn crop yielding 230 bushel an acre compared to a soybean crop yielding 62 bushel per acre. And, and I've compared uh, corn and soybean on the, the total requirements for each crop and how much of those nutrients are removed from the field via the grain on an annual basis. And what we see for soybean production is that we actually need more nitrogen in a soybean plant than what we do with corn. Fortunately, we can get some of that nitrogen from the, from the uh, nodules in the ground, right? I mean, on, on, we, if, we, if we can get half from the nodules, um, half of the nitrogen from the nodules, we're in pretty good shape. So take this number, cut it in half, do a little rounding, that's 135 pounds of nitrogen per acre that's uh, in the soybean plant from the nodules. The problem, however, is that in this soybean plant, we remove almost 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre. What is that? That's a deficit of, uh, of, I think, about 65 pounds. So in a lot of cases where we think we have a nitrogen credit or a carryover for the next corn crop, that's not actually true. <clears throat> we can get 135 pounds of nitrogen from the nodules in the ground, but we remove 200. That's a deficit of, of around uh, 60 pound, 65 units of uh, nitrogen. And in this uh, following slide, that Fred Hayes here. Thank you, Vanna. So what I have here is the nitrogen uptake or, or fixation wherever the nitrogen comes from with different yield levels. So I'd say right now, uh, US average, we're, we're in this 40 to 45 bushel per acre range. We want to get up to 85. 
we want to get up to 85, 85 bushels per acre in, in soybean, we're going to need 350 pounds of nitrogen in a plant. The challenge, however, is that only 200 of those pounds will come from, fixa uh, come from nitrogen fixation in the air, the nitrogen that's in the air. Where is the rest coming from? It's going to have to come from the organic matter in the soil or fertilizer nitrogen. Well, also, what's ma what makes this a real problem is that um, the more fertilizer we supply, the less active the nodules are. So you can't supply fertilizer and hope that the plant can still fix nitrogen. It's usually one or the other. The plant preferentially takes up uh, nitrogen in the form of uh, in the form of fertilizer because it's uh, it more efficiently uses it within the plant. And instead, if you deprive the plant of fertilizer, it will preferentially put on uh, nodules and fix nitrogen. So the challenge is we can get half or a little better than half of our nitrogen from fixation. The, the, the difficulty is finding a way to come up with this delta or this difference. And that's what the focus of several of our experiments are at the U of I, finding a way to supply nitrogen, especially later on in the growing season when the soybean plant needs it most and the nodules are getting tired. Another key nutrient that we have is phosphate, phosphorus. What we see is uh, in corn, we, corn requires about two times as much phosphorus as what we do for soybean. But contrary to that difference, one of the similarities is, is we remove great amounts of phosphate in each crop. 80% of this total uptake, or 80 pounds, is removed with the grain in corn every single year. Of this 50 pounds accumulated in soybean, 39 pounds, or around 40, are removed from the grain, removed from the soybean uh, via the grain every single year. That's, that's one of the challenges um, we have for soybean production is trying to find a way to make phosphorus available and replace phosphorus as fast as what we are removing it for our soybean production. I'll explain to you here in just a minute why I think phosphorus is probably one of the more important nutrients. But then also <clears throat> what I have for you is uh, potash. Most growers would say or, or we've been taught or we've learned over the years that potash is probably the most important nutrient. I, I'd actually probably disagree with that. Corn and soybean each require the same amount of potash, 180 pounds. Uh, at these yield levels, but when the corn crop is done, um, the difference between this and this is around 120, 120 pounds, and that is left over uh, for the following soybean crop. 120 pounds of potash is in the leaf tissue, the stalk tissue, and is quickly available, and and that easily supplies what we need for a soybean crop plus the little bit it'll find in the soil. Uh, yeah, we do remove slightly more. Uh, potash or K2O on an annual basis with soybean production, but that's only because uh, the, the concentration of potash in the grain with soybean is, is quite a bit larger than what we have for corn. But, but to further show and illustrate to you why potash is probably not the most important nutrient, I'll describe to you this in this figure. And with this figure I have the potassium uptake and partitioning for soybean crop yielding 62 bushel per acre. And what I have is the total uptake of potassium on this y-axis it presented in pounds of K2O and the percent of that total in percent on this y-axis. And then finally, two different ways to think about the growing season, days after planting, or if you can see it below this lip here, growth stage. Growth stage, V stage is uh, represented with V's, reproductive stages in R's. And what we see is pot potassium uptake in soybean is rapid early on in the growing season from day 30 up to the day 80. There's a 50 day window where it takes up potassium and it takes it up very quickly. Six pounds of potash each and every day for 50 days. But the problem or the, uh, the interesting component about this is that it, if the soil is low in potassium, it'll maybe take up slightly less. If it's, if it's more rich in potassium, it'll take up slightly more. Whatever the difference is, it stores all the extra in the stem. When the grain eventually needs this, the blue area is indicated by grain tissue this the stem area by the yellow color. And when the grain of soybean eventually needs this potash, it pulls it from other areas of the plant. In this case, it pulls it all from the stem and it, and it puts it into developing grain tissue. So therefore, later on in the growing season, when the grain is developing and it needs the, the, the potash, it doesn't have to go to the soil to find it. It's already got it within the plant. It can just pull it from somewhere else. Potash is not the most important nutrient. And, and I would argue that, that actually phosphate is the most important nutrient. 80%, there's, this, there's uh, about 80% of the, the nutrients that sit 
in the grain for corn or soybean are eventually removed via the, the, uh, via the grain. And that's why phosphorus is actually the more important nutrient. And what we have here is the uptake and partitioning uh, figure for phosphorus. And what I have here is uh, in a soybean crop yielding 62 bushel per acre, we'll need about 50 pounds of phosphate regularly uh, on an annual basis. And what happens is, is it takes up, takes up phosphate for, um, from 30 days after planting all the way to around 100 days. There's a period of 70 days where soybean plants are taking up uh, around one and a half pounds of MAP, mono, mono ammonium phosphate, each and every day for those 70 days. It partitions it throughout the plant, leaf, tissue, stem, flowers and pods, eventually the grain tissue. But what really develops here is this, uh, the grain tissue. The grain tissue um, needs it in pretty large quantities and it depletes anywhere it can find it from within the plant. So by the time we're harvesting the, the uh, soybean crop, there's nothing left in the stover. Everything is in the grain. We harvest the grain, we remove the grain, so we remove the phosphorus. On average in Illinois, um, farmers uh, fertilize, thanks Fred, farmers fertilize on average 90 pounds of phosphate before they grow their corn crop. 90 pounds of phosphate. That's enough to cover the amount that we remove for our corn but that only gives us 10 pounds to, reco uh, to uh, compensate for the amount of phosphate we remove in our soybean production. Uh, only 20% of the growers in Illinois fertilize phosphorus for their soybean crop. And, it, and if only 20% do that, 80% are, are depleting their soils at a rate of uh, 30 pounds of phosphate every other year. And that's why we see, see such large phosphorus fertility responses in soybean and corn production. Phosphorus is the key nutrient. And that's why fertility's number number two, and that's for 62 bushel soybean. I'm pretty sure it's even worse Thanks. for 85. Oh. So uh, number three is the is the variety selection. I suspect uh, you like me, you agonize long and hard over your corn variety, and then you take any old soybean. You know, is it round? Okay, who cares? Plant it, and that's a big mistake. For all soybean varieties are not equal. If you look at the uh, the Illinois uh, soybean variety test, there's a 20 bushel yield swing between the highest and the lowest. And I'll show you 10 varieties that we grew last year under our high-tech management system. I'll show you our high-tech management here in a minute, but presumably by growing it under high-tech, we've removed any other limiting factor for soybean yield, and then we can focus on that difference due to variety. So 10 varieties grown last year uh, at, under high-tech management, we saw an almost 12 bushel swing between the highest yielder and the lowest. Almost 12 bushels, so your variety does make a difference. Now I wouldn't believe this if I didn't see it, but half of these varieties were Roundup 1 and half of them were Roundup 2. And the Roundup 1's came from more than one seed company. Which ones do you think are the Roundup 1's and which ones do you think are the Roundup 2's? Roundup 1, Roundup 2. Roundup one, roundup two. Every single roundup two yielded higher than the roundup one. Seven bushels higher on average. So the trade also makes a difference. And that's pretty much why, you know, that lawsuit on roundup one and two was settled. And then when I see something like this, even though roundup one comes off patent and I can bin run it, do I want to give up those seven bushels and have to go to the hassle of bin running that seed? Variety makes a difference, the trait in the variety makes a difference and that's why it's number three. So number four, this, uh, this is, uh, has to do with protecting the leaves. It's foliar protection and if you look at a soybean plant, the soybean plant, this, is, this sucker has 19 or 20 nodes that can support pods and guess what? It's the leaf at that node that supplies most of the energy for the pods and beans at that node. And so therefore protecting the photosynthetic capability of that leaf as long as possible has a big impact on how the uh, pods and beans at that node uh, fill. So I'm talking about things like uh, leaf disease uh, from insects and, and I, can, I can show you how, why and how foliar protection is so important by, uh, by showing you what, what, what components make up soybean yield. You can make soybean yield into a math equation by multiplying you know, these three components together. So soybean yield is a function of the, how many pods you have per acre it's a function of how many seeds you have within each pod, and it's a function of the weight of each individual seed. 
And you can increase or decrease any one of these and be responsible for an increase or decrease in yield. And if you think about how these work, um, pop, uh, a pod number per acre, that's largely a function of uh, weather and fertility. The number of seeds per pod, that, that, that's largely a genetic feature. I can't tell you how much time I spent looking for a five bean pod, you know, when that was worth something. Uh, I obviously, I didn't find one. Um, and then the weight per seed, that's a function of the foliar protection, how long you can keep those leaves active. Now, the most important one of these yield components by far is pods per plant. Uh, uh, pods per plant. Um, where do you think the, the most uh, yield or the most pods on each plant are, and what do you think an individual pod, uh, an, e uh, an extra pod is worth? Bro? Does anyone have an answer to that question? How many, how many bushels per acre is a pod worth? Take a guess, somebody. One more pod. Bushel? Twice that. Each pod is two bushels. Where do we find most of the pods? We're in between nodes 7 and 13. This is where 60% of the yield on the main stem right here. This is where we see 60% of the yield. This is where all the flowers are. This is where all the pods will be. This is where 60% of the yield will be. If we're lucky, we can get 10, 15% maybe uh, of the yield on the branches, but it's all right here, right in the middle. Actually, where, where I see, and, and Fred and I agree on this, where we see the, the biggest potential for increased uh, soybean yields is at the upper third of the plant, nodes 14 through 20. Um, you know, with some of our different practices that we may choose to implement, that's where the extra yield is going to come from, is up to on top. So that's why foliar protection is number four. Number five is uh, treat the seed. Yeah, I know it wasn't many years ago when you didn't treat seed. And when you use untreated seed, that's, uh, that's called naked seed. I like the sound of that, but I don't like the result. So, so seed treatment. Now, now there's a, a lot of things you can put on the seed. You, you can put inoculum on the seed for nodulation. You can put a micronutrient on the seed. You can put your favorite growth regulator on the seed. But the seed treatment I'm going to talk about is, is protecting that seed from diseases, insects, and nematodes. And, and that seed treatment is especially important if you're blessed with an early planting. You know, it helps, it helps the crop emerge. But it does way more than that. By getting that seed off to a good start and protecting those roots, now you can have a more rapid rate of growth and the impact of seed treatment can often be observed well after emergence. And we demonstrate that here. Uh, I'll show you these plots here. And this is the effect that uh, we can really see with our eye, both last year and this year. Uh, it took us till about uh, R2 to get around to taking a picture of it. But I, I show you here a, a minimal seed treatment, fungicide alone. And this is a, a complete seed treatment, the fungicide, the insecticide, and the nematicide. And I hope you can spot which one has the better growth. Is it here or here? I'll play eye doctor, here, here. <laughs> it's obvious, and I could use this scientific instrument to tell you how much better the growth is. So the uh, seed treatment, not only does it help you with emergence, but it can also help the subsequent growth after emergence. And then finally, secret number six is row arrangement. So yeah, here I'm talking about wide rows, 30 inch rows, or narrower rows. And, and one of the advantages of narrower rows is that uh, they intercept light faster. One of the disadvantages of narrow rows is you don't have as much air movement through the row. And if you want to make a, uh, a, 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 an in-season application, you often have to run over the rows. You know, that, that, that's one of the reasons you gave up the drill. You know, because you had too much white mold, too much row, too much rows run over when you had to make a, a corrective application. And I, I mean, I love running over soybeans as long as it's yours. Uh, so, I think the future of uh, of corn is going to be a 20-inch row, and I won't go into why I think that is. But I, I think the future of corn is ultimately 20s, and therefore I think the future of soybean is ultimately 20s as well. Hopefully I'm going to plant with the same planter on the same day, my corn and soybean. And I think 20 is going to be a compromise between a, the, 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 er, the uh, better light interception of a 15, but a little bit better air movement. So our sixth secret is uh, row arrangement. And we are uh, looking at 30 inch rows and 20 inch rows. And there in the 20s you can see they intercept light better, but there's less air movement through that row. <clears throat> Another reason that I think that uh, 20s is going to be the future of soybean is in a 20 inch row with a toolbar I can band my nutrition. 
And this is one of the things we'll show you we're doing. We're taking and we're banding. We're banding the fertilizer and then using RTK, we're planting right over the band. That allows us to get the full value of the fertilizer, keeps the fertilizer from being on the surface, subject to loss, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, maybe potentially allows us to use a little less fertilizer if it's all right there. And we can band a 20 inch row, but you can't band a 15 inch row. Well, you can, but you run over the back end of the band with the tire tractor. So we think that, uh, that uh, the future of soybean is going to be 20 because of the need to band that fertility. So given each of these six secrets and that explanation and justification of each of them, we came up with a high-tech package. Leave it forward. We came up with a high-tech package that involves uh, five, uh, five, uh, five enhanced management factors and we compared that to a standard package if there is such a thing the standard package is in orange and the high tech is in uh, in blue so on the standard side I'm assuming it's a 30 inch row you might be 15 a high tech is a 20 and one of the reasons the high tech is a 20 is because in that high tech system I banded the the fertility we used uh, we used the rate of phosphate fertilizer that it would be required to grow 85 bushel soybean and we banded it right under the row. We also used a premium fertilizer. This is a Mosaics Micro Essentials and that's MAP that has sulfur and zinc in the same granule and some of that sulfur is fine ground elemental sulfur and so that serves to acidify the granule and keep the phosphate and zinc more available. So not only are we using technology to place it but we're also using a fertilizer technology to try and keep that phosphate available for that 100 days that Ross showed you he needed it. Now on the variety side, we, we tried to, we tried to uh, identify an offensive variety for the high management, the defensive for the traditional. That was a hard question. If any of you know what those are, let me know. But so we, we, we rested on maturity. And we decided on the, on the offensive side, we better plant the fullest maturity possible for the region. You know, if I might normally grow a 3-2 here, I, I, put, I made the offensive one a 3-8. If I'm going to plant soybean earlier and I'm going to throw all this management at it, I better take full advantage of the season. And, uh, you know, here's what I usually do. I don't know what you do, but usually I harvest corn first and then I harvest soybean. And by the time I get around to harvesting my soybean, the grain moisture is usually 8%. And I give the elevator about four free bushels. I mean, I'm tempted to sneak out the garden hose uh, under those conditions. So I just assume harvest the stuff at uh, 13% and take full advantage of the season. So that's what we did in the high tech. On the foliar protection side, we either used no foliar protection or we used a, a fungicide or an insecticide or we actually mixed the two to look at the potential synergies between them. Uh, seed treatment, it was, either, uh, it was either naked seed or fungicide alone versus a complete seed treatment. And so we, uh, we took this high tech system uh, and, and compared it to the standard system and we put out uh, Five plots of there, six plots of this in our state last year, uh, in, in a big diamond pattern. Here's our our, our research uh, sites. This is Illinois. Uh, how many of you here are from Illinois? A couple of us. Yeah. Well, well, most of you. So you know Illinois. This is the land of Lincoln. It is also apparently the home state of President Obama because he spent a little time up here. But I'm pretty sure he wasn't born here. Um, and <laughs> So we, we, I'm not sure where he was born either, but uh, we, we, varied the, uh, we varied the maturity depending on where we were in the latitude uh, in Illinois. We used, uh, we used different, uh, different uh, company genetics or protection products. So we had Syngenta genetics and Syngenta protection, and then we had Asgro genetics and BSF protection. This allowed us to tap different companies for the additional resources. And, and then at each of these sites, we, uh, we banded that fertility right under the row. Now, um, I, I'll tell you, I haven't, uh, I haven't figured out, uh, go to the mission plot one. <clears throat> if I have a difference between the high tech and the standard, that's pretty easy to demonstrate. But the minute that uh, the high tech is better than the standard, the question becomes, which one of these factors is the superstar? I mean, I got five factors here. It's like my basketball team of management. I mean, who's my LeBron James that I got to pay for regardless of cost? Or which one can I bench, which better yet means I don't have to pay for it? That's a very difficult statistical question. 
So to, in order to answer the question, which factor is the superstar and who's the slacker, we, we came up with the omission plot design. And I know you hate experimental designs, especially right after lunch, but uh, I'm a glutton for punishment. And, and if you don't understand this design, you're not going to understand the data that we show you. So omission plot design is 12 treatments. I have, I have the full Monty right here. There's the high tech. It's all five. There's the, uh, there's the traditional uh, practice. You know, and I, and I hearken this to like my basketball team, uh, for the five factors. This is like my pro team. This is like my high school team. And I'll assume that the pro team usually beats the high school team. And then what I do, one factor at a time, is I take the high school player and I put him on the pro team and I see how badly that one high school player drags down the performance of these other four pro players. Hence the name omission plot. And I do that for every position. Then at the same time, I take the high school, or the pro player, one at a time, and I put him on the high school team. And I see how well one, high, one pro player can elevate the performance of those other four high school players. And I do that for every position. And this is sort of like standard agronomy, if you think about it, if I had five factors that I wanted to compare. It makes a great visual demonstration in the field because in a small space, I can see a big difference in yield. And then I can walk these plots and root for my favorite factor or player, which is probably whatever it is I'm trying to sell you. Um, but <laughs> we put this in Illinois, uh, six sites, and uh, we did it in both 20 and 30 inch rows. I can't figure out how to vary the row on the go, so I have to have the 20s all next to the 30s, which doubles the size of the experiment. And uh, I was pretty sure, I was pretty sure that uh, some factors would be more useful in 20s than 30s. But you remember last year's weather? Remember the weather last year? You know what I do when the weather's not working for me? I, re I refer to the weather using that pregnant dog term. I say, this weather's a real pregnant dog, and last year's, <laughs> last year's weather was a real pregnant dog, I'll tell you. If it wasn't for a good rain the first week of August, I don't think we would have had anything. So I'll tell you, most of our yield was made by one good rain the first week of August. And uh, so because of that, I, I, last year we didn't have any interaction between 20s and any of the other factors. Normally, I'm going to tell you that if you're in 20s, the fertility is more important, the foliar protection is more important. It wasn't last year. But, so I've averaged the 20s and 30s together. Now, there was an impact of 20s and 30s, and it depended where you were in the state. Remember, DeKalb's in the north, Harrisburg's in the south. And what we saw is the advantage of 20s was greater in the north and less in the south. And if you, if you think about the north, it's a longer day and a shorter season. It also, also had more rain. And if you go down to the south, it's a shorter day and a longer season. And last year, we had less rain. And by the way, if I know I'm going to have less rain, I'd rather be in a 30-inch row because then I got 10 more inches to draw water out of. And so last year, in DeKalb, the, the 20s were 6.5 bushels better than the 30s. It was uh, 2.6 bushels the other way around in, in Harrisburg. And again, I blame the weather for that. But overall, 20-inch rows were worth a little over two bushels more than 30s. And I think that's the future. So what I'm going to show you next is I'll show you the difference between the high-tech and the traditional at each of these six sites. And there was a big difference in yield at, uh, at, at, at each of the six sites. But at every site where we had the high-tech package, we produced more yield than the standard. So here's, here's my six locations, or six sites. There's the yield of the standard. You'll see quite a range. There's the yield of the high-tech. And see this? This is a scientific symbol that means I subtracted this from this. And so that's the yield gain from the high-tech system. And it ranged anywhere from 7.5 to 12 bushels more. There's a lot of yield to be had uh, in soybean from crop management. I'll show you this side first. So if you're only going to do one thing, what was the one most important thing you should have done last year? And I've averaged all these sites together because You'd get bored fast if I showed you all six, and I'd run out of time. So this is averaged all together. And on average, last year, the standard was 50 bushels. Now remember, I'm adding one factor and only one. And the superstar last year was the extra fertility, which justifies our placement of the, it being the second secret. You're simply not adequately fertilizing your soybean. Last year, that, uh, that extra fertility was worth almost five bushels. Um, the, the, the number two was, uh, was the variety or the insecticide. When we used the fullest maturity for the region, we gained 3.7.
and that uh, that's corrected for moisture. If I had to use the moisture, I brought it into the elevator, it'd been even more. Well, it wasn't a lot of disease last year, so the fungicide was only worth two bushels, but but still two. The, what what we had last year was a little bit of bean leaf beetle, and when we controlled them, we gained almost four. And and when we added them together, well, it was at least in the right direction. Even though that seed treatment was screaming out of the ground, it, uh, it was only worth 2.8 bushels. But every one of these factors gave an increase in yield. You can decide which is most economic for your operation, but this shows you there's a lot of low-hanging fruit on soybean from crop management simply because you're not adequately managing it. Now I'm going to show you the high-tech side, which is 10 bushels higher, and the question becomes, you know, what happens if I omit one of these high-tech factors? So there's the high tech side, it's 9.9, .9, almost 10 bushels more, and now I'm looking at what happens if I omit that factor from the package. In other words, if I left the fertility out, but I still had the other four, I gave up 3.7 bushels, it's the biggest effect. If I, uh, if I left the, uh, if, if I used the normal maturity for the region, um, I lost almost three bushels, couldn't take advantage of, of all of that management. If uh, I actually had a little better uh, value of the fungicide under high tech, without it, it was 2.8. Uh, and, and actually, on the high tech system, when I added the fungicide and the insecticide together, I got a little bit of a synergy, or at least when I didn't use them, we lost a little more yield. And when we didn't include the seed treatment, we lost 2.4. Now, I guess the bad news is that if I looked at the, the value of each individual factor alone, and I added them all up, I was going to use all five. I would predict a 15 bushel yield gain, but it's only 10. So sadly, sadly, these things don't add up to support each other, and I blame the weather for that, or I blame the indeterminate nature of the soybean plant, and I think it'll be different in a different year. But at least they partially add up. Now, and in order to see if we had the secrets right, what we did is we, we took the value of it alone, and then we took the loss of it in the high-tech system, and, uh, and averaged them. And so last year, we, what we saw was, on average, the fertility was worth over four bushels. That was the, that was the biggest factor, justifies our placement at number two. Last year, the uh, foliar protection was number two, worth almost 3.6. So you gotta protect those, uh, those leaves, get that extra pod. Again, as the, if we had an offensive variety or a foliar maturity, we gained a little bit of a yield in that regard too. Seed treatment on average worth 2.6, row arrangement worth 1.2. Fairly closely in order with our six secret arrangement. So the good news is, in conclusion, there, uh, there's some yield to be gained in soybean from crop management. Who would have thought? I mean, that's why you're here, I think. Um, that, why, why I wish, they, why I wish that uh, you could uh, uh, add up the value of each individual factor in a high-tech system, at least they're partially additive. And I, and I, I think that uh, in a different year, they may, they may completely add up. So I, wa I, I want to end by, uh, by, thanking, by thanking the Illinois Soybean Association for supporting this work. This is your checkoff dollars at work. Couldn't be doing it without them. I also want to thank some of our other uh, corporate sponsors. I want to thank Mosaic. Monsanto, Syngenta, BASF, Winfield, and Growmark for supporting this work. And uh, if you're a glutton for punishment, I got a website here that uh, has additional information. Some of, uh, some of our report, some of this uh, uh, information that we presented, that's the website. And I know it's long and cumbersome, <clears throat> but uh, if you Google Crop Physiology Laboratory at the University of Illinois, Crop Physiology, not psychology, crop, that's, crop psychology is a whole other website. Uh, you gotta go Google crop physiology, University of Illinois, this will come right up. So I, I, I hope we, I think we saved some time to be able to show you the demonstration here. The fairies have put out a fantastic demonstration for us of the high tech and the standard system. And so uh, what, what, what we're gonna show you here, and I want you to, I want to encourage you to look at this. This is the, uh, and this is the same variety, it's a three, four variety. This, this uh, right here, that had the extra fertilizer. That was, this, that was 187 pounds of, uh, of map, Mosaic's map. The fairies didn't have a toolbar and we couldn't bring ours here, so they broadcast it. I think banding's better, but if you're not fertilizing at all, it's better to do it anyway than not at all. So this has the uh, fertilizer and the complete seed treatment. 
This is actually a Victor complete. And then right here, we're gonna get fungicided here in a minute. Right, right here is the same variety, but the fertilizer was applied the year before to corn, and that's just the uh, fungicide, insecticide treatment. That, uh, that'd be Apron Max. And I, we pulled out a few plants here to show you the difference, but I'd encourage you to look at it. Here's the high tech. I can actually see some pods. And there's the standard. There's a lot of yield to be gained in crop management. So I will end there. I'll take any questions if anybody has any, and I encourage you to look at uh, these trials that we have out here for you today. You had one, uh, Rushville one, Rushville two. What was the difference between? So uh, yeah, yeah. The uh, at Rushville, I had a whole set of Asgrow uh, uh, BSF protection, and I had a whole other set of Syngenta Syngenta protection. So it was two separate experiments with different company uh, genetics and suppliers. We have eight of them out this year. Uh, two questions. I think you may have just answered one. I, you're repeating your omission plot this year? Yes. This is not an omission here. This is just showing high tech right. and standard. And how, how would you apply, if you draw a formula, your 75 pounds of PTO5? We banded it this year with our toolbar. So we have a telescoping toolbar, which is actually a Dawn 6000 anhydrous knife that has a dry slot on it. We put a gandy box on the back of it. You can, you can meter dry fertilizer really accurate, and you could put an enormous amount of dry map near the seed. Liquid or potassium, you can't. So we band that fertilizer four to six inches deep. We plant two inches right, right over the top of it using, using RTK. We get an enormous uh, early growth enhancement. It, uh, we see it at every site this oh, yeah. year, don't we? Soybeans, corn. I mean, and this is, this is soils that would be 30 to 60 part per million phosphate, Malik 3. I'm guessing this is a 50 part per million Malik 3 soil. There's a screaming improvement. So I'm not convinced that uh, soil test is necessarily calibrated for 85 bushel soybean. You know, I mean, that'd be my guess. Um, did, that, did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, have we, have we done broadcast versus placed? Well, this is broadcast here instead of placed. Uh, and and uh, we have that work for corn. We, we've compared broadcast and placed for corn. And, um, yeah, I mean, broadcast is certainly better than none, but, uh, but the placed allows you to get an extra value of it. You know, when you, when you ban the fertilizer, it's, it's not on the surface to be run off. It, um, you can potentially get a, a higher yield with a little bit less of it. So we have not done that with soybean yet. And, and we're not telling, I mean, this is not a recommendation. You know, there's no one size that fits all. What we're trying to do is show the biological potential of, uh, of using each of these practices. So I, 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 if you're, the, the way we're currently fertilizing soybean, which is not at all, um, you could benefit from broadcast as well. Yes, sir. So the question is, in a given year, if you have extra pods that are blanks, would an extra pod increase or decrease yield? And I, and I think when, 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 when Ross said that uh, uh, one pod was worth two and a half bushels, that's one pod with beans, of course. And, and, <laughs> and on, average, on average, there's two and a half beans in every pod. And a blank pod is, might as well not have it. I mean, and most of the blanks are on the top of the plant, aren't they, Ross? Right. <clears throat> so, when, when we say an extra pot, I mean an extra pot with beans. And greedy as I am, I'd like to have five beans in there, um, but I'll settle for two and a half. When you foliar feed it, or uh, question is, fungicide and insecticide, what about using a foliar feed? Ross, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, we, we're, we're actually starting to dive into a fair number of those studies to look at foliar feeding. Um, what can we foliar feed? Macronutrients, micronutrients, when? You know, R3, a lot of people target R3 application, you know. Uh, maybe about a week ago here, but uh, we we have uh, we get a lot of questions about that, and we've we we have a fair amount of studies that that are going to look at that. The, the challenge with some micronutrients is that uh, <clears throat> well, the challenge with macronutrients is when you do a foliar application, you often can't get enough down. I mean, the application rates are pretty low, so you can't supply a lot to begin with. The challenge with micronutrients is that a lot of times um, it 
the nit nutrients, although you feed them uh, foliarly over the leaves, they don't get to where they need to go. In a lot of cases, they need to go to the developing grain tissue. And if you spread them on the leaves, sometimes they don't remobilize or be transported to the leaf or into the, to the grain tissues. Now some nutrients, they probably hold out some more promise, like boron and zinc. That probably works a little bit better. Um, it, it, it seems in soybean that a lot of the zinc stays in the leaf tissue anyway, and it's not really needed in the grain to start with. So for some micronutrients, yes, a foliar application in R3 will probably work. For some of the micronutrients, it, it probably won't be very helpful. Anything else? What about, what do you think about, because I can't think of the name of the new applicator they're using on the high clearance sprayers to put the nutrients out by the rows? I've seen like Heggies or something? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the wide yeah, wide drop. Yeah, I think it's a possibility. And I, I like the possibility to put, maybe put some late season urea on it, as well as potentially side dressing some phosphate. Um, there's no one size that fits all. I mean, we're just trying to demonstrate to you, here's the factors that you have to optimize and then it's your ingenuity to figure out a way to optimize those. So a, a, a side dress end at a right time or, or potentially a, 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 a phosphate I think is a huge possibility. I'd say that by the time you hit to the, the R4 growth stage is when you're really going to start to run low. The, the, the simple fact and the problem with this matter is that the nodules get tired over time, right? They start to shut down. They, it's just it's been a long season for them and they get tired. And, and that's actually when the, the, the nitrogen is needed in the, plas, in, in the plant to the largest degree. It's when we're developing the, the grain, the, the soybeans themselves, the beans, the actual beans. The concentration of protein is very, very high. And a lot of that protein is made up of nitrogen, way higher than what we have for corn. The concentration of nitrogen in a soybean is five times as high as what it is for corn because of the high concentration of nitrogen or the protein in soybean. So the, the simple fact is that later on in the growing season, probably at R4, when those beans are developing, is probably when we need the nitrogen most, but we have the least available for them. Freddie, you have any insight on yeah, so the, that uh, Anything that's good for the plant is good for the nodule because the nodule gets its energy from the leaf. So if you have a happy plant and, and happy leaves, your nodules are going to last longer. So that, that weather that gives you a, a, a nice leaf, a happy leaf is going to help the nodules as well. Yes, sir. So you, you're talking about starters? Yeah, so uh, we've had this question quite a bit, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll chime into it and I'll let Russ um, tell you what we're doing. I mean, any fertilizer on soybeans is better than what you're doing, so starter is helpful, but it uh, might not be enough to meet the whole needs of the crop. When we ban that fertilizer under the row, the whole raid, that's starter on steroids. I mean, that's, that's, that's telling it, hey, the going's good. So I, I, I think starter is in the right direction. The the liquid is the liquid is uh, is got a high salt index, so you'll you could potentially burn the plant if you put too much liquid. It's dry. the 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 it's dry map is safe, not 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 potassium, but dry map would be fairly safe. And we we, we have some nice starter effects this year, I believe. Yeah, it's uh, even in soils that test very very high with uh, you know phosphorus and uh, potassium, we still see pretty decent responses with starter applications. I mean, when, when we're doing some starter applications, we're, we're lucky if we can get down five or ten units of, uh, you know, like phosphate or potassium or something, but you, you can't actually get that much down. And early on in the growing season is when soybean plants probably don't need the extra nutrients as much as what it would later on, especially during this, this time of the year. So the, the starter application is helpful up front, but we need to find ways to really supply the nutrients later on, like right now. That's when they need it the most. Well, I, I, want, I want to be able to show you these plots, so uh, uh, Ross and I will be happy to chat with you individually, but uh, I would encourage you to, uh, to check out these two rows that have the uh, complete seed treatment that are fertilized with the same exact variety planted the same date with the uh, uh, minimum seed treatment not fertilized. Mm -hmm.